Good evening. Welcome to our Wednesday night class. We're happy to have you with us. If we have visitors, we're happy to have you. We want to welcome everyone, those in the parking lot and Facebook, wherever you may be, we want to welcome you to our Wednesday night Bible class. So if you would, would you bow with me as we start with a prayer? Lord, we thank you for another day you've blessed us with. We thank you for this time at midweek that we can come together and to study from your word. We thank you for your son. We thank you for your word, for what it means to us and the hope of eternal life, Lord. We pray for those that are less fortunate, those that are sick, those that are in the rest homes, Lord, and we pray for those in Ukraine that are in the war, Lord. May things change soon. Pray that you'd continue to watch over us, care for us, and forgive us of our sins. In Christ's name, amen. good to be able to meet tonight to open our Bibles to the book of 1 Samuel as we're moving through a study of the Old Testament in some survey form leading toward a New Testament study, Lord willing. But as we move through, there are some chapters that deserve a special look and sometimes a verse-by-verse -verse look at those chapters. 1 Samuel 7 was one of those, and we looked at that one last time. And 1 Samuel 8 is another, because both of these chapters lay a foundation for things that we will meet in the rest of our Old Testament study. And with a knowledge of these two chapters, I believe you're better prepared to move forward in the Old Testament and to meet some of the things you're going to meet. There are four major divisions that I'm going to use with the book of 1 Samuel that I trust will be of help to you as you take notes if you desire and as we move through this study. In verses 1 through 5, we might entitle that section, Samuel's Sons. And it is in these five verses that we get some detailed information about these sons. In verses 1 and 2, we learn they were blessed with advantages. There are children in this world who are blessed because of their parents. Sometimes because of the affluence of their parents, sometimes because of the position of their parents, sometimes because of the disposition of their parents. And Samuel's sons were blessed with advantages. There are two particular advantages that we see here. In verses one and two, they were appointed judges over Israel and if you're underscoring and things as you take notes, by Samuel. And they judge from Beersheba, which tells you they're in the southern part of what we call Palestine. You can look that up on your map. Now it came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second, Abijah, judges in Beersheba. I do not know the entire significance of this statement, but I do know when you compare it with previous things that are said in the period of the judges, there's a difference that we know. In all prior times, when a judge was raised up, God raised him. But here it is said Samuel appointed these sons judges. Now we'll have to get to heaven to know for sure, but we do not know if Samuel did so with Jehovah's approval. 
Some have suggested that by Samuel's taking it on himself to appoint his sons, that this may have been an attempt to make the judgeship an hereditary office. And there seems to be no indication God ever intended it so to be. The judges were always especially raised up by Jehovah, never taken from the same family line and not even from the same tribe. So they were not intended very likely to be hereditary like the priesthood was. So one writer said Samuel erred when he made the appointment and his doing this meant the judges had failed. And I'll let you take that for what it's worth. But <clears throat> there is no indication God ever meant for the judges to be hereditary. And if you keep that cycle that I gave you in the beginning of our study of the period of the judges, Israel sins, God raises up a nation to come against them to punishment, punish them, they go into servitude or slavery. Then they petition God as they repent of their sins and they make supplication to God for deliverance. And then God raises the Savior. That's different here. So here we see a departure from the norm. And Samuel, as we know history, was our last judge. So they were appointed judges and they were given appellations or names that tied them to Jehovah. What about Joel's name do you see that would tie him to Jehovah? The L. The L. And Joel means Jehovah is God. Jehovah is El, the powerful God, the mighty God. All right, what part of Abijah do you see that would tie him to Jehovah? <clears throat> Don't make it harder than it is. It's right there in front of you. What? Put one more letter with it. Did you just say A-H? Put one more letter with it. J-A-H, Yah. And evidently you don't remember, you're supposed to remember everything I ever say, that in the Psalms and in other places we've been introduced to Yah as one of the names of Jehovah. What is, what is there? Y A H? A B I A H. That's why you said A H. Abaya. Abaya. I did, because that's. That's the original idea. Abijah. That the name means Jehovah is Father. Jehovah's Father. And so Jehovah is God, Joel. Jehovah is Father, Abijah. So he, they were given names. We don't know anything about Mrs. Samuel. So we don't know who gave the name, Samuel or Mrs. Samuel, but they were given names that tied them to Jehovah. So they were blessed with advantages. Questions or comments? All right, in verses 3 and 5, they were base in their actions. Now, what's the first word in 3 in your translation? And. And the and there is used in the sense of the New King James wording, but. They were judges, but. Samuel made them judges, but. His sons did not walk in his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain. Do you have filthy lucre, King James? After lucre. 
took bribes and perverted justice. And the elders come in verse 5 and say, Look, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. So the lifestyle of their father was not their lifestyle. So if you have that but, you'd want to mark that. Here's a contrast. And notice that their conduct would be known to Jehovah and to Israel. So here you have a nation seeing that their judges, their religious leaders, aren't walking according to God's way, like Samuel did. So they had not profited by Samuel's example. Samuel is a model of integrity, a model of faith, unselfishness, one writer said, rarely equaled. And yet they went wrong. What do we learn from this? Having a godly parentage does or does not guarantee the children will be faithful. Does not. Why? Free will. What? Free will. Free will. Once I reach that age where I'm responsible for doing right myself, then it's up to me to make the choice to do right. I have a choice. Now, as parents, we can teach our children correctly. We can model what they ought to be in front of them. But if they choose to go astray, if we have done everything God tells us to do as parents, we've taught them correctly, taught them diligently, and we're under the law of Moses here, so Deuteronomy 6 would come into play here, teach them when you get up, when you walk in the way, when you sit in your house, when you lie down. That does not guarantee you that they will choose to do right. Now, if the parents, that's if, the parents have done what God commanded, then who is going to be held responsible for how the children behave? The children. The father, Ezekiel 18 tells us, shall not pay the penalty of the sin of the son. And the son shall not pay the penalty of the sin of the father. And Ezekiel 18, 20 says, the soul, the person who sins, he shall die. So that's individual responsibility. Romans 14, 12, we shall all be made manifest or we shall all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Every one of us will appear for himself. 2 Corinthians 5.10, we'll appear just like we are. Romans 14.12, each one of us shall give account of himself unto God. So Samuel was a model, and these sons were given advantages, but they were base in their actions. And one of the things they did was... They trample the ways of their father. Now, even though Samuel's a model of what he ought to be, would the conduct of these sons help, hurt, or have no effect upon Samuel's leadership? It would what? It would hurt. So here's a godly man who's everything he ought to be, but his sons are not what they ought to be, and his influence is harmed by grown children who are not living the way they ought to live. Now, that can happen to a preacher, can happen to elders. 
what their children do, how their children behave, can either help or harm the influence their father will have in a leadership capacity. Grown children need to think about that. How is my conduct reflecting on what my father's trying to do? And I met with an elder this year who said, my daughter refuses to dress modestly. And he said, I tell her, I tell her, I'm keeping on telling her. She's a college graduate, but apparently living at home. And I keep on teaching her and telling her, but she said, I'm going to dress the way I want to. Now that hinders him as an elder. That hinders his influence. If he ever tries to talk to anybody else about modesty, what are those people going to say? What about your daughter? I worked with a group of elders one time who repented of not practicing discipline as they should and told the congregation, uh, we're going to begin a program of re trying to restore the unfaithful. And we went out, uh, we, because they invited me to go with them, started a visitation program on Monday nights, and w we visited every family in the congregation. And we particularly visited unfaithful families. And the elders related to them, you know, here's where you're unfaithful. We're begging you to repent, and if you refuse to do so, then we will be forced eventually to withdraw fellowship from you. The very first home, the fellow, the person in the home looked at one of our elders and said, what about your son? He had an unfaithful son. What about your son? What about 22, uh, Proverbs 22, 6, about training up the child away? I will, just a minute. What about your son? <clears throat> now this was one of the most godly, Bible-versed elders under whom I've ever served. And he looked at that person and said, his name is on our list. He's not going to get by because he's my son. If he doesn't repent, he will be disciplined also. He meant every word of it. Train up a child in the way that child should go means that every child's different. You train children differently. Those of us who've had more than one realize that two children are not alike. So what works with one won't work with the other because dispositions are not alike, thinking is not alike. So you taper your training to that child. You train him in the way he should go. All right, that's also under the law. So Proverbs 22, one to six, Proverbs. Deuteronomy six, one to six would come into play. And when, even when he is old, he will not depart from it, will not depart, go astray from what? What? The training. Does that mean he'll live by it? No. Why? What? For he will. If that guaranteed, just because we train them correctly, they're going to be faithful, that would remove free will. They wouldn't have a choice no matter. But they'll never leave that training. Now, I believe you have an illustration of that in Luke 15. What brought the prodigal son home? What did he remember? All right, he remembered the training of his father. Here's how my father takes care of the hired hands. You think that father taught that boy something? When he left home, did he live by it? No, turned his back on all of it. 
So whatever can bring one back, if he goes astray, if he's been trained correctly, will be that training. And you will deal with some people sometimes that will tell you, I know I'm not living right. How you know that? I was taught better than this. So Solomon gives us a pithy saying there that gives a general principle that shows you train up a child the way he ought to go according to that child. The child will never be able to leave the training. He may not live by it. That's what Proverbs 22, 6 addresses. I'll stop and let y'all follow up on that. Since y'all aren't going to follow up on that, I will move forward. So they trampled Samuel's example. They turned aside. And here the Hebrew word natal is used figuratively of warping justice. They warped justice by turning aside after lucre. Turning aside after lucre. All right, what is lucre? Money. I heard money. Dishonest gain. Dishonest gain, the King J New King James. Lucre is from a word which means personal benefit derived from some activity. And here, their personal benefit was financial gain, dishonest gain. Can a lust for personal gain ruin people who have been trained better? If so, how? Okay, I know the way I'm earning this is wrong, but you'll always have that but in there, and that's the bad but there. But I'm going to do it anyway. I know the case of a member of the church who was engaged in his livelihood doing things at least one thing which he could not justify by the Bible. He admitted, I cannot justify it. He admitted it to his preacher, he admitted it to his elders. And then he followed up with this, but I need the money right now. And that says, I know I cannot justify what I'm doing, but I'm going to do it because it brings me the personal gain that I want right now. That's Samuel Sons. So they turned aside after dishonest gain, getting money. You ever heard anybody say by hook or crook? Getting money any way they can, whether it's right or not. Now, this word, translated lucre here, is sometimes translated covetousness. You see the connection? Covetousness is desiring that which is unlawful for you to possess. Sometimes it's translated dishonest gain, like it is the New King James here. Sometimes just gain and sometimes profit. So they turned aside after dishonest gain. Now, what is <coughs> one of the ways they brought in the dishonest gain? They took bribes. 
What's the significance of the fact they took bribes? <coughs> They're judges. So a judge who takes a bribe would take a bribe for what purpose? I'm sorry? Change the outcome of the trial or decision All right. It, I bribed the judge to get him to do what? Rule in my favor. Whether it's right or not. Rule in my favor. You with me? They're judges. That doesn't ever happen in our court system, does it? Bribing a judge to get a judge to rule in my favor. All right? You see what you read in the daily newspaper and hear on daily new broadcast has already occurred and has been recorded in your Bible. Solomon will say there's nothing new under the sun. And in principle, that's, tr that's true. That's <coughs> true. So they take dishonest gains, and having done that, that leads them, as we've tied it in, to do what? Pervert justice. And the idea of pervert is to twist. To twist the proper outcome of a governmental decision. Right? The indication here is Samuel was just the opposite. So these boys have gone, we might say, as far away from daddy as anybody could go. Which seems to be, if I'm correct, what the prodigal son tried to do. As we call him prodigal. By the way, what does prodigal mean? I don't know. I'm asking that question. Now, all of you have a little handy-dandy device. Use it. Now, I'm hearing something, but I'm not getting Okay. What's the last part? Yielding abundantly, Durant's often used as a nature has been so prodigal of her bounty. Okay, so a misuse of gain, is that what it's saying? Read that first part again. Characterized by her use or wasteful expenditures. Wasteful expenditure. Anybody have anything else? Take your hand away from your mouth, hold your head up, and yell at me. A person who spends money in a recklessly extravagant way. Okay. That's what the prodigal did, we're told, is wasted his substance. All right, now, song leaders. God is calling the one who wastes profusely what he has. And particularly, see if I'm correct, money. Does that do anything to you for the meaning of the song? Are we inviting people who waste their money to respond, or are we misusing a term to apply it to all sin? You think about it. You work it out. But the idea is what these boys have done and what the prodigal did. So they twisted justice. Now, every bit of this is condemned under the law, true or false. Revolts. That's true. So while Samuel's upholding the law as the last judge, his sons who are judges are doing just the opposite. They're perverting the law, violating the law. If you'll read Leviticus particularly and look at the 
penalties for perverting justice and the warning against perverting justice, you will understand how far these boys are astray from God's law and where they are. They were also baneful in the aftermath of their actions. Now, if they took bribes and perverted justice, against whom are they sinning? God. God? And what else? The people. They are sinning against the people. By extortion, what word would tie in with extortion? Bribes. Bribes. And by example, and what would that be? What's their example they're setting? Okay to do what? Take bribe, pervert justice. All right, turn aside after lucre, pervert justice. It's okay to do that. All right, how often or could could the people in Israel have done the very same thing and said? If confronted, my preacher said it was all right. Do you know anybody that takes a stand or engages in an activity and when confronted answers by, well, I asked my preacher and he said he didn't see anything wrong with it. So your preacher is not final authority. You get that? I particularly want you to get it here. The Bible's final authority. I said to a man today with whom I was studying, now, I've told you this, you go study it out and see if it's right. You don't accept it because I said it. I'm not authority. The elder said it was all right. Okay. That's all. Are the elders final authority? Now they are in matters of judgment, aren't they? Not matters of authority, matters of judgment. But not in Bible authority. So that's why elders and preachers have such a, a hard responsibility and so important to make sure we're right in what we say. We're right in the answers we give people. It, it's not a light thing for an elder or a preacher to answer somebody about a matter. We need to be sure to the best of our ability we're giving biblical advice, biblical answers. That makes sense to you? Now, there are three lessons I want you to get from these boys in these verses. Number one, goodness and righteousness cannot be inherited. Goodness and righteousness cannot be inherited. So that means every generation has to make its own decisions based on the Word of God. That means every generation has to be taught the Word of God. Every generation has to have opportunity to know the Word of God. Now, that brings in the importance of our educational program in the local congregation, does it? And that's why every teacher that walks into a classroom is responsible for what's taught those boys and girls and men and women. And it's not a matter of just taking up the time and doing something, playing games, 
giving trinkets. Actually, you could call that kind of stuff wasting time. But what are we teaching? What lesson do those little boys and girls, those men and women come away with from what our actions provided? What are we teaching? And I have said to y'all here a lot of times, don't listen to how someone's saying something. Listen to what they're saying. Wrong things can be said in a way they sound right. Now what the devil did in Genesis 3 to Eve? He said the wrong thing, but he said it in a way that sounded right. Did the same thing to Jesus in Matthew 4. Sounded right. It wasn't. So goodness and righteousness cannot be inherited. You ever heard anybody say, well, I brought them up in the church? Well, what they meant, what they mean by that? I brought them to the building faithfully. The only person who can bring one up in the church is somebody who's training them spiritually. I brought them up in the church house. Okay, good for you. What were they taught while they were there and what were they taught before they got there and after they left? So it can't be inherited. Number two, power is dangerous in the wrong hands. Power is dangerous in the wrong hands. The statement I'm about to make is a moral statement, not a political one. Do you see the importance of electing godly people to office? Power in the wrong hands is dangerous. You see it right here. And number three, as y'all have mentioned several times, free will individual responsibility the soul who sins he shall die Ezekiel 18 20 all right questions or comments on Samuel's sons James one of the things that I keep seeing over is how similar this was to the first couple of chapters in first Samuel with Eli and his son uh, however with Eli And if he did? They didn't listen. All right. They didn't pay him any attention. They didn't listen. Like this elder's daughter I mentioned. He's trying. I know him. I know his character. He's trying hard. She's not listening. I worked at a place one time. We had an elder had a daughter like that. I don't know how hard he tried. I wasn't convinced he was trying. But I know as far as I was concerned, it ruined any influence he would ever have with me. And so individual, individual responsibility. As a parent, my responsibility is to teach. And my children will tell you, they don't always like what I keep telling them, but I'm going to keep telling them as long as I can talk. And I'll often preface, now I know you're grown and I know you're going to do what you decide to do, but you need to listen to what I'm telling you and consider it. And that's my responsibility, even though my children are grown, have children of their own. That's my responsibility. They're no longer in my house, but that doesn't mean I'm not responsible to them. That makes sense. Those of us with grown children, does that help any? All right, anyone else? Good observation. Anyone? All right, the second division, verses 4 through 9, I call, and I don't like this word, but it's the best I've been able to find for it, Israel's suggestion. I really think it's stronger than that. 
but I wanted to alliterate so you could remember it easier. Verses 4 through 9. Now look at verse 4. Oh, by the way, keep this in your mind. This section dovetail, dovetails and comes off of what we just learned. What we've just learned is what brings this next section about. The conduct of Samuel's sons is the, may we say, provoking thing, the motivation that brings the next section about. So look at the people who came to Samuel in verse 4. Then A-double-L, all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. Remember, Ramah is where Samuel lived. Verse 17, chapter 7, and where he judged when he was home. So all the elders, so here's your leadership in the nation, is now going to address the leadership of the nation. So you have the judges, the judge who is leading the nation, and then you have the under leaders, if you please, that are leaders over the tribes. And they come. <coughs> and those, I, I don't think it's exactly parallel, but the idea of the chief shepherd, 1 Peter 5, will reward the under shepherds, the elders when he comes. So you have the chief leader, the judge, and then the under leaders. That makes sense to you, the way I'm saying that? Uh, the heads of the tribes, the fathers. They came to Ramah where Samuel lived, judged Israel, and had built what? What? No. No. What? The altar. the altar. Chapter 7, verse 17. Thank you. So they come to the religious center, don't they? Where Samuel not only is judging, but where he's leading apparently in worship. And notice the proposal they have. And said to him, King James, do you have in verse 5, behold? Okay. New King James, look. You are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now, make us what? A king to do what? To judge us? If you have ever underscored anything in your Bible, underscore the next four words as they are in the New King James. Like all the nations. All right, notice the first thing in their request is they presented the reasons, didn't they? You're old. Now, this is almost an insult, but most people have decided. Samuel's about 60 here. Now, I refused at 60. When I hit 65, I announced to you I am now governmentally old. But I'm not old. I'm 30 in my mind. And I do some things, my body says, who are you kidding? You're old, maybe about 60. See people, lifestyles declining from the period of the patriarchy. We don't have any 969s anymore. And his sons did not walk in his ways, all right? So they presented the reasons, then they proposed a resolution. Make us to a king to judge us like all the nations. Now tell me, who are the nations? 
I think one of them has spoken. The Canaanite. That's one. The they are the Gentiles. The Amorites, the Philistines. Yeah. And how, what's the P word we could use for all of them? They're pagan. They're not serving Jehovah. We want to be governed. We want to be like all the other nations around us. Now, in the few t minutes we have left, and I'll take up here, Lord willing, next time, what does this violate in the law? What's this thinking violate? Well, that would be a good assignment. What does this thinking violate as far as what the law teaches about what Israel is? Those of you who are joining us by social media, we thank you so much. Our next broadcast, Lord willing, will be Sunday morning at 10 a.m., and we trust you'll be with us then.